Well, the whole idea is to try to shut down puppy mills, to put in regulations for breeders of companion animals, dogs and cats, so that breeders themselves know what is expected of them and how to raise their animals humanely, but also for the public to know uh, what is expected of the people that are raising the animals that they want to bring home with them. Well, it's pretty specific and quite comprehensive with regards to uh, the standards of care that are required for folks that um, want to breed animals, including sanitation, exercise, socialization, the age that you're allowed to start breeding, depending on whether or not it's a dog or cat, uh, when you can um, adopt the, the animal, and the actual uh, physical uh, conditions of the cages, etc., and the homes that the animals are living in. I actually did um, have dreams of becoming veterinarian, but that didn't, didn't pan out. So here I am 20, 25 years later, um, trying to improve uh, the, the fate of our, our furry friends um, from a, le from a uh, legislative perspective. In April 2010, um, animal rights issues in British Columbia reached a tipping point. Um, following the Olympic Winter Games, a Whistler sled dog company uh, slaughtered 100 dogs after business slowed down. It was said at the time that the new homes could not be found for the animals. As more details emerged at this disturbing mass slaughter, uh, public outreach in British Columbia, but not actually just British Columbia, it was actually worldwide, sparked an investigation. And it was the most complex investigation that the BCSPCA had embarked on. The investigation led to charges of animal cruelty against the operator, as well as significant changes to the way that the sled dog industry operates in the province. After the investigation brought to light one of the highest profile cases of animal cruelty in BC history, it was apparent that the public was in favor of tougher laws to protect animals. The sled dog tragedy allowed our government to revisit the province's animal cruelty legislation and a sled dog task force headed by my colleague, Dr. Terry Lake, who's actually a veterinarian by trade and is now our Minister of Health, was created to look into preventing what occurred um, and preventing and hoping that it would never happen again. And after a fulsome investigation, the task force produced a final report that gave 10 recommendations, all of which were adopted by our government. In the spring of 2011, we introduced amendments to the BC Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act. The changes included an increase in the statute of limitations for offences under the Act from six months to three years, increasing fines for offences up to $75,000, and increasing jail terms up to two years. And it, hold, it held companies and owners more responsible for the welfare of their animals. These amendments effectively gave BC the toughest animal cruelty laws in the country at the time, with greater penalties and increased accountability through the new legislation. And the changes to the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act received a lot of positive feedback from communities and animal welfare organizations across the province. But I always felt that more could be done to enhance the protection of companion animals and help prospective breeders identify, identify and caring and humane breeders. And we've all seen images in print on the web, on television, of dogs and cats crammed into tiny cages, some without adequate food or water, others in enclosures that aren't properly cleaned, mothers who are constantly impregnated and treated like a factory farm, puppies and kittens taken too early from their mothers and sold to either pet stores over the internet or through classified <coughs> ads in the newspaper, often to unsuspecting shoppers. And there's a name for these operations, puppy mills and kitty mills. Unfortunately, these images we see too often. And in fact, in January of this year, CTV aired a news story about puppies that were rescued from an owner in Victoria, and I alluded to it in my preamble in the legislature. The owner was hoarding the animals that allowed them to breed unchecked in a home in Brentwood Bay. Living conditions were so bad, their safety was heartlessly jeopardized, and in the end, 45, 44 puppies were rescued and one was found dead. The story that story demonstrates the importance of my bill. If my bill was in place in January of this year, it would have helped the SBCA intervene sooner in this case because the number of female dogs capable of reproduction at this home was greater than what is specified in my bill, i.e. three or more females. Despite the fact that the conditions the officers witnessed during previous visits 
had not been deemed grave enough. They could not remove the animals at the time. So in other words, if my bill was in place at that time, that would have allowed them to intervene sooner. So in May of 2011, I, be I began to look in ways to, ch to um, how, how to deal with uh, perhaps increasing the legislative teeth of animal welfare agencies, for instance, the SPCA, on shutting down puppy mills. And it was clear to me that we needed to do something in legislation that gives the province and animal welfare organizations, organizations the power to enforce animal welfare policies while encouraging more self-regulation and more responsibility among breeders, but also for better education for the public. And there is a demand for this legislation. And again, there was another instance in Vernon in February of this year where the City Council, and I understand that the Vernon City Council is actually, the City of Vernon is actually uh, nominated for an award at this summit, but they chose not to put any bans on pet stores selling animals in uh, their stores because they realized that that wasn't part, that was perhaps part of the problem, but it certainly wouldn't alleviate the problem because of course we do have the instance of animals being sold in the internet. Um, as well as on the classified ads. So that's where I stepped in, and that's where I had to work with numerous people within the legislature and um, people that helped me draft this bill. Um, and I did a lot of research, actually, in other jurisdictions, um, not just across Canada, but from around the world. I looked at legislation from Ireland to New Zealand to Texas. I researched uh, recent seizures from puppy mills, um, I reviewed their reports and their recommendations, as well as those from the College of Veterinarians of BC. I also consulted with Dr. Terry Whiting, who is Manitoba's Chief Veterinarian Officer, Dr. David Fraser from the Animal Welfare Department at UBC, um, Dr. Marco Vinice, Chair of the Canadian Medical, Veterinary Medical Association in BC, uh, Dr. Carol Morgan, who is a veterinarian who is also on the Sled Dog Task Force, uh, Dr. Christine Armstrong from the College of Veterinarians of BC, Dr. Ken Langelier from the Island Veterinarian Hospital, and many other veterinarians. Unfortunately, the data show that animal cruelty is on the rise, and I've got some examples in my notes. I'm not going to get into any detail about other um, jurisdictions that have had to uh, pump up their legislation as well. So after months of research, I started drafting this framework that was titled, The Standards of Care for Breeders of Companion Animals. And it was first introduced in the BC Legislature on April 23rd, 2012. And the purpose of the bill was to, to establish comprehensive standards of care for those considered under the law to be operators of breeding premises. And in this particular case, it was breeders with three or more female dogs. Under the proposed legislation, operators have a legal responsibility to understand the welfare needs of their animals and must meet the highest standards of husbandry and care. The bill outlines specific areas of care which operators must address, including providing adequate food, water, shelter, sanitation, socializing animals, tending to illness or injury, providing safe transportation and using humane euthanasia methods, and keeping detailed birth records. The bill does not affect reputable breeders, as they are already doing what is required in this legislation. And what it does do is grant legal authority to animal welfare agencies to shut down shady operations and bring charges against the owners. And operators who fail to comply with these requirements would be subject to punishment under the amended rules of the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act. Feedback to the bill was generally positive, but there were groups such as the, re the group called Retain the Right to Crop or Dog, who actually worked very hard with selected breeders across the province to lobby uh, MLAs in the British Columbia Legislature to um, essentially bully them into voting against the bill. Some felt it was not government's right to tell them how to do their own business. So I went back to the drawing board and I began further consultations with rescue groups, breeders and stakeholders because I really did want to get support from breeders. And the way it was going with the original way it was written um, with regards to dealing with surgical procedures, which animal welfare agencies and certainly many veterinarians and animal welfare organizations were very, very supportive. 
but I needed to, if I was going to do a bill that was putting legislation on breeders um, standards of practice then I needed to get support from breeders so I had to uh, had to amend the bill and I brought it forward on March 5th in 2013 which is this year but as you already know and and Jason has already mentioned, we immediately went right into an election. And so the bill actually never made it to second reading. So now where it's at is it's, it's ready to go um, in, to be reintroduced. But what, I've, what I want to do now is do more consultation, but do it through the ministry. And in this case, in British Columbia, it's the Ministry of Agriculture. And I have talked to our Minister of Agriculture about this because it will have a greater chance of getting passed if I go through a ministry as opposed to a private mem member's bill. Because how it works in a legislature, even though all BC Liberal members are allowed to vote with their conscience and, conscience and vote however they want in any bill, um, certainly if you've got uh, the support from the ministry and uh, the House Leader, uh, then you have a greater chance that your own members will support the bill. I don't have any control over the independent member or the opposition members um, and how they would be heavily lobbied to not support the bill, but at least we have the majority. So if the uh, BC Liberal government decided to put forward this bill, um, generally speaking, it would pass. So I think that there is enough support um, to, to bring this for forward. Um, and as I said, moving forward, I would, I would get more consultation. I'm thinking I would also need more consultation from CAP people because I only had, believe it or not, one person that actually responded from, uh, who was an expert in CATS. The rest of the people were all um, more or less dog people and, and dog breeders. So I'll either uh, revise the CAT, the cat um, portions of the, of the bill or uh, take out CATS altogether because obviously their needs are totally different. So I think the legislation did bring um, forward uh, one of the main goals, which was public awareness. And it really does start with informing people as to where they are getting their animals. Because we all know that there's a lot of impulse buying going on when people walk past a pet store, or they see a cute little doggy in the window, or they see um, a picture on the internet, or even in the newspaper. So at least what this bill helps to do is educate people that they should ask to see the parents, um, ask to see the living conditions that the animal was raised in, um, and then asks and, and really requests that people know where their animals came from and the living conditions that they came from. And the other thing I learned about bringing forward this bill is collaboration, and certainly the whole intent of your summit here is getting people that um, maybe not, not um, years ago would be in the same room together, um, are now in the same, uh, the same room together. And the whole idea is to get people together because we do have one goal, and to celebrate where we agree and where we can move forward to make um, the lives of these animals much, much better. So it, it has been an exercise in, in collaboration and getting all sorts of groups together. But before I, before I take questions, I'd just like to put a special thanks out to the summit people and, and um, uh, the folks that nominated me um, in, in your foundation and in, in your summit um, for this award. Um, because I, I think it's, it's, it's important not just because it's mine, but because um, at least it brings to light that you can, you, anybody, can bring forward um, legislation if you have a goal, if you have a champion, and you have somebody um, that you know, um, and everybody can, can get to know their elected officials. We're just at the end of a phone or at, at, in our offices, and I would encourage you to do that. But I'd also like to thank my, my own Minister of Health, who used to be the Minister of Environment, who used to be a practicing veterinarian, Dr. Terry Lake, because he definitely did um, help me with this. Dr. Marco uh, Venice, Dr. Carol Morgan, Craig Daniel, and Jeff Erton from the BCSPCA, Louis Lacan from PJAC, and Catherine King, who is uh, a breeder of standard poodles, actually, in my riding, who helped me kind of modify it for, for breeders. But other than that, um, thank you all, and I am to totally welcome to uh, accept questions. And then I, unfortunately, I have to, to leave. <laughs> Anyways, any questions? Thank you, Jane. I'm Mary Lou Lear, and I'm with Toronto Animal Services. 
I'm wondering how you define breeder in, in the proposed legislation. Um, that's a really good question. In this particular um, proposal, it was three or more animals. I know that I was just talking to Lewis about um, some legislation that's coming up in Quebec um, that they use 15. It was not an arbitrary choice. We didn't want to uh, go after sort of um, your mom and pop, your mom and dad that want to have, you know, one litter to show their kids, um, you know, and then spay their animals sort of thing. I, I didn't think that was appropriate, but we didn't also want to have it limited to traditional puppy mills because everybody is responsible and we just wanted to make sure that it, it we, we kind of landed in three, um, three or more, but we're, we're certainly open to, to changing that, but I haven't really had any people comment negatively on that, on that number. Any other questions? Brenda Bonnet, and I'll be speaking, I'll be addressing a little bit of this in my talk later this afternoon, but I wanted to ask you, I know in the United States there are uh, commercial breeders participate in various organizations, lobby groups have uh, a collective uh, voice. Uh, does that exist in Canada and have you approached them as a stakeholder in this? Do you mean lobby, lobby groups to, um, to support the bill? No, I mean organizations representing commercial puppy breeders. Um, like, are you talking about like, the Canadian Kennel Club? No, I mean commercial breeders, what you call puppy mills. Oh, okay, the actual puppy. Well, no, I have not. Um, I would love to get some breeders that would, except for individual breeders that I that approached me, I would love to get some um, legitimate breeders that would come on board and support this bill. Um, and if they have a, um, as you say, an operation, then I would definitely like to talk to them. Um, I did not get any feedback at all from anybody that was willing, that had an operation like that that was willing to support the bill. I had um, people that were part of greater operations, particularly in urban British Columbia, who were working to fight the bill. Thanks. Any other questions? I think this is an example of how members of parliament, members of legislative assembly, we can work with them, if not to change laws and legislation, but at least to raise profiles on issues that we as an urban animal industry think are important. And I know that Jane, this was not easy for her to come here in the context of her portfolio in BC is education. And so this is an extension outside of her portfolio. So she needed to seek extra permission to be here today. And so I think it just speaks to her commitment to being a voice for um, the animal, the urban animal industry and animals. And I just ask you to join me in thanking her one last time. Thank you.